Today is August 1st. Woohoo! Last month of summer. Sort of. No, stor no storms so far. We're doing good. If you have a Bible, let's open to Psalm 84. If I could give this psalm a title or describe the, the theme of it, it'd probably go like this, the living God, the living God. Because when you find God or he finds you, however you describe that mysterious thing that happens where Peter Marshall, that great pastor, said you have that unmistakable tap on the shoulder, and he comes to live in you, who you are and who you will be, and all that you do begins to change, begins to turn around. And the psalmist here in chapter 84 describes it with great emotion and uh, well, well, listen to what he says, Psalm 84. How lovely is your tabernacle, or you could translate dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. And this is where he begins to get passionate or emotional. My soul longs, yes, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out, and here's our theme, for the living God, my heart and my flesh. Lord, inside me and outside of me, I, I cry out for you, how lovely is your dwelling place. And of course, the writer here would be speaking of the Old Testament tabernacle or temple, that wonderful edifice, that building in Jerusalem, the holy city, where the presence of God would dwell and all the, the, the feasts and festivals would be centered around. And, and now today, of course, we talk about God's dwelling place. We, we think of ourselves because God's Spirit lives in us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, it says, Or do you not know that your body is the dwelling place or temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you're not your own? How lovely is your dwelling place? And he gives some reasons here why he has this sense of excitement and desire and longing towards the Lord, towards the living God. The first one, he says, is because your dwelling place is lovely. Now, you might be looking around the room and say, John, I'm not sure that's true. There's a few lovely ones, but I don't know. How lovely is your dwelling place? Well, here's the deal. Please listen. The place where God lives, the heart that God dwells in, becomes a loving, lovely place. Paul describes it like this, and I'll read it for you from Ephesians. Listen to what it says. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of him, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what's the width, the length, and the depth, and the height. You and I were this dwelling place, we're this temple of the Holy Spirit, and it's described in Scripture as a lovely place a beautiful place, because God begins to take us and change us on the inside and make you beautiful inside. Sometimes he takes you through some interesting circumstances to break us and mold us and shape us. But you and I should be changing inside. 
So you should be easier to get along with than when you first got saved, right? Ask your wife if that's true. No, don't do that right now. You, you, you should be less difficult as a person, quicker to forgive. The Bible says he who is forgiven much, and we all have been forgiven much, loves much. And Jesus said this, uptight, grumpy, critical, angry Christians need to repent. Well, I said that. Jesus didn't say that. <laughs> he would want to say that. Uptight, grumpy, critical, angry Christians need to repent. How, how lovely is your dwelling place? That's why he's excited. Lord, what, where you live becomes lovely. And you create a hunger and a longing for yourself. How lovely is your dwelling place? And my soul longs, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My, my, my heart and my flesh cry out. Lord, Lord, your dwelling place is lovely because you're in it and you make it lovely. And two, you create a hunger. You create a longing for yourself. You ever, ever feel that way? Lord, I want to know you more. I desire more of a sense of your presence in my day, in my life. I, I, I want to feed on your word, Lord, till I'm satisfied, till, till I feel like, okay, yeah. Okay, God, you've spoken to me. I've heard you. I, I feel uh, full. Remember that old worship song? Day by day, dear Lord, three things I pray to see thee more clearly, to love thee more dearly, to follow thee more nearly day by day by day. Anybody remember that old song? About four people. Oh, you guys are dialed in this morning. There, there's this uncanny ability of God. Listen, this uh, strange, mysterious paradox that God has to satisfy us deeply inside and at the same time make us hungry for more. It's kind of like Chick-fil-A sauce. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I would never describe God as like Chick-fil-A sauce. But God has this ability to satisfy us, but at the same time make us hungry for more. The living God creates a lovely dwelling place. The, the living God creates a satiable, insatiable hunger within a heart for Him. And He also gives us joyful, what I would call, vitality. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. I cry out to the living God. It, it could be translated that, that I sing for joy to the living God. He gives life, He gives joy. And it's not something that you fake. It's not the church mask. You know, you walk into church and, and you have that, that church smile or whatever you, you want to call it. The, the, the psalmist here is trying to convey the, the impact and response of a relationship with a living God. How it looks. What it feels like. And here he says it makes you cry out to the Lord. It makes you express your heart to him. This, this is some of what it means to, to have the living God come along, tap on the shoulder and say, I want to know you. I want a relationship with you. One, he makes your heart a lovely place. He gives you this longing and desire to feed upon him and be with him. And he brings a sense of, of joy into your life. And the psalmist is trying to con convey how it looks, how he feels, and how you express your heart. You and I were created not to live some monotonous, boredom, Dullesville life. It's like the story of Jesus in John chapter 4 where he meets a woman at the well. You know this story comes upon this woman, she's, she's jaded, I would say she's bored, she's been through five marriages, I think life for her was pretty stagnant, 
pretty mundane. She apparently kept going around the same block again and again and again. And Jesus says something very interesting to her. He says, whoever drinks of the water I give, in John 4.14, whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. A spring, a fountain. He, he, he would enter your life and he would become a source of life that she could drink from at any time. That's part of the way that you and I, listen, that's part of the way that you and I can live life and love life when circumstances become redundant, are difficult, are stale, are bland, are get crazy, are difficult. Here's what Jesus says. Take a drink. Not, 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 not at the brewery. Not at the bar. Not it's five o'clock somewhere, margarita time. Take a long drink of the living water within. You say, well, John, wait a minute. How, how do you do that? How, how, do I, how do I do that in my life? Well, number one, I would say you can do it. Well, part of how you do it is like this. You take a drink of his character. You remind yourself of who he is and my relationship with him. When, when, when life is kind of stale or difficult or, or, or the enemy is attacking in some way and everything seems to be against you, take a drink of his character and remember that, that he's the loving father, you're the prodigal son or daughter who came home. And you found forgiveness. You, you found acceptance in him, not judgment, not rebuke. You, you found a robe, not a rod. You found a party not punishment. You found a dad, not a dictator. You, you just began to, to drink in who he is. I found him. He's a great physician. He healed me. He cleansed me of a broken heart, of discouragement. He changed my attitude. And he became, and this is how I begin to drink when I feel discouraged, he, he, he became the, the lifter of my head. I could see beyond. He's my Savior and my Lord. He's the one who forgave me. He's the one who cleansed me. He's the one who said, neither do I condemn you. Now start living the life I created you to live. And if I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. When I take a drink, I begin to drink of who he is and his character. He's that friend who sticks closer than a brother. When it feels like no one else cares what you're going through or the difficulties that you're experiencing or they just can't relate, he never leaves, he never forsakes. And he's constantly changing and renewing. He's my faithful God and my soon coming King. When I look back on my life, I, 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 he's been more than faithful than anybody or anything. And he continues to be that way. In all my fears and doubts and freakouts, he's always been there. And I look forward as I'm drinking. And he's my soon coming king and my great hope. And as I drink that in, I'm refreshed. I'm re-energized, and I can still be in the same circumstance, but with a whole different attitude and a whole different perspective. I drink him in. My heart and soul, my flesh cries out for you. The, and the next two verses describe the contentment and the satisfaction that, that only the living God can bring. Look what it says, verse 3. Well, even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King, and blessed are those who dwell in your house. They'll still be praising you. And he mentions some birds here. He, he, he mentions uh, two birds that are found in Scripture. The first one is a sparrow. 
And you remember Jesus talked about sparrows in Matthew chapter 10. He says, are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground? And your father knows. He goes on to say, uh, do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. He's saying this, and, and, and he used this idiom, this illustration, because sparrows today, probably as well as then, were a popular symbol for people who felt insignificant, that they didn't matter. Sparrows represent people who feel no one cares. I'm not worth much. I'm overlooked. I, I, I'm, I'm not important. But what the psalmist is saying Even those who feel useless or unworthy, who don't really count in their own mind or belong, well, you can find a home. You can find a place of acceptance. You can find a place of security and belonging and fulfillment and rest in a relationship with the living God. This is why the psalmist is so, you know, moved by this. He says, man, my heart and my flesh, they cry out. He says, how lovely, Lord, is your dwelling place. Uh, Even the sparrow can find a home. And when you come home to the Lord, listen, when you decide, you know what? I'm tired of this life. I'm going to let the Lord give me a place. And you come home to him. You find a great sense of purpose. Someone once said it like this. It's usually those who have a deep sense of hurt or failure that God can really use because they understand how other people really feel. And so the psalmist says, even a sparrow, one who feels useless, Gideon was a guy like that. Remember his story? He felt so insignificant. He, we're, we're just, you know, a small tribe. We don't amount to much. He was so convinced that he was weak and that he didn't have anything to offer that the Lord himself said, come on, Gideon, you can do it. He, he argued with him. He said, no, Lord, I can't. You ever been that, Gideon? The Lord comes and says, I, I want to use you. I want you. Just, just take, the, take the bushel off a little bit and let the light seep out. Watch what I'll do. No, no, Lord, you can't use me. Yeah, Gideon, I can use you. God wanted to use his life. It was the same with Moses. He he hid in the desert thinking, I blew it. You ever blown it? You may not have killed an Egyptian. You wanted to maybe once or twice. Whatever that Egyptian is in your life. But God used Moses. You see it over and over again in Scripture. When when did Jesus say to Peter, feed my sheep? Was it right after he said, Lord, look at your disciples. What a pathetic group. You can't count on these guys. They'll they'll fall away. They'll all bail on you. But Lord, I'll be there to the very end, Peter said. Is that when Jesus said, okay, feed my sheep, Peter? No, it wasn't. It was after he denied him three times and wept bitterly and felt like he was useless and couldn't be used. Not until he denied him and wept bitterly in John chapter 21, I believe it is, verse 15. So when he had eaten breakfast, you guys know the story. He said to Simon, Simon, son of man, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then he said, feed my sheep. I don't think there had been a time that Peter felt more more defeated, more useless, more overlooked, outside the group. And that's when the Lord called him to be used. For even the sparrow finds a home and a place to be used. And then he mentions another bird. He says, and the swallow, a nest for herself, or she may lay her young, even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and God. See, before I went to seminary, I I got out of Bible college, I got married, 
And I spent years studying to be an ornithologist. I don't think you knew that. No, I never studied to be an ornithologist. <laughs> I can barely pronounce the word. It's those who study birds, right? Right? Okay. Come on. I feel like I'm talking to... You ever seen those Muppets, you know, these two old guys? Okay, let's raise it up a little bit. Okay, I'm not an ornithologist, but there are swallows, and swallows are birds that fly very erratically and just seem very... I, I, I'll put a little video up here of some swallows. They're just always restless. And I was going to use the Alfred Hitchcock bird thing, but <laughs> with the uh, telephone booth, but no one knows what that is anymore, so I decided not to. But, but he mentions the swallow here. And the swallow is a bird that's very erratic, very, very restless, uh, very swift in flight. They seem erratic. And, and, and if the, the sparrow is a symbol of those who feel insignificant, no one cares, then the swallow is one who are always looking for the next thing, for, for something new. But even the swallow, the guy or the girl who, you know, oh, well, this job would be better, or, this place to live will be nicer, and, you know, this will make me happier. This, the, the, the swallow is that kind of bird. And the psalmist says they can find a home in the living God, a place of purpose, a place of fulfillment. In Matthew 11, Jesus has these beautiful words. He says, come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle, lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So, so the psalmist says, you know, those who feel insignificant, unloved, and, and those who feel they're never satisfied and restless, Lord, they can find in the living God a place called home. And these aren't just poetic and spiritual words that Jesus is using to kind of, you know, soothe the crowd. These are words of promise of life from Jesus, that if you come to me, if you're scattered, if you're torn, if you're restless, if you feel insignificant, he says, I can give you rest. He says, even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. This is where I, where I come to find, find stability, security. It, it, it's a place called home at, at your altars. And he, and he gives us two pictures here of the living God. Look what it says there as we just kind of dissect this passage. He, he tells us there in, in chapter 84, he says, uh, Even your altars, verse 3, O Lord of hosts. And then he says, My king and my God, Lord of hosts means the Lord of multitudes, the Lord of thousands, the Lord of many, the Lord of great crowds, the one who all creatures of the earth depend upon and are made from. You know, he makes the sun and the air and gives life and food. That's the Lord of hosts. That's who he describes him as. And then he also says, my king and my God. And he makes it very personal, very intimate, very relational. And God can do that. You can be sitting here today, and it seems like God is speaking directly to you. And at the same time, God can be speaking to everyone in the room. Or he can be speaking to a person halfway across the world. God has this unbelievable ability to be so personal, so close, so individual, speaking directly to my circumstance, my trial, but at the same time, talking to others who could be a million miles away. And he talks about what happens when the living God is at work in our hearts. Blessed are those, verse 4, who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Blesses the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage as they pass 
through the valley of Baca. They make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. He says in verse 5, Blessed is the man whose strength is in you. You know, you hear a lot of people sometimes say, there's power, there's strength in prayer. And, and, And that's, in a sense, true. But it's really the power of God who answers prayer, right? It's not the strength of your prayer or the power of your prayer. It's the God who you're praying to. That's the strength. And God gives us His strength, His power. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, we have this wonderful promise. It says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And when you come to the living God, He gives you this sense of strength. We know, see, I believe... And, and, ah, you, 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 you kind of watch the news again, and, and things are starting to get crazy again, right? You're hearing all this stuff about the Delta variant. You're hearing, you know, the masking up, the, the, the pressure about the, the vaccine. And, and we're going to just, uh, I want all the vaccine people to move over here and all the, no. <laughs> so, so this is getting real again, right? You're hearing all this stuff starting to happen, and, and you're wondering, okay, what, what's going on? And, and you, you're looking at so many different floods that are happening all over our, our nation, America, and things that are happening. I heard, heard there might be a flood or drought or something in Brazil, and of all things, not only gasoline, but coffee might be going up in prices. Here's, yeah, I, that's the first amen we've gotten out of the congregation. Uh, <laughs> So, so we're just going to end there. And so, <laughs> go get some coffee. So, before it goes up, um, man, I totally lost my train of thought here. Oh, here it is. <laughs> so, based on all that's going on in the world, we begin to realize that perhaps again we're closer to the end. And we say, come Lord Jesus. But we're not helpless, we're not powerless, even though we don't know the day nor the time. In in Acts chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, let me bring those up. He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or season which the Father has put in his own authority, but here's what you can do. He goes, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon me, you, and you shall be witnesses to men in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. And that's our call, the power of the Holy Spirit to be a witness. And, and I just want to challenge you with this. The, the realm of where you work or where you live or the people you, you rub shoulders with, you don't have to, in the culture we live in right now, Be extremely bright with the light of Jesus is what I'm talking about. To be a witness. It doesn't take much these days. You begin to share your lifestyle. You, you let them see a normal Christian. You, you tell them who you are. And it's amazing the impact it can have. Don't hide your light under a bushel. Let it shine. Let them know that you love the Lord, that you, you go to church. And, and it, it says, because here's, here's where I'm going with, blessed is the man whose strength is in you. I know where my strength comes. I'm on this pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Now, now Baca was a place in the Old Testament of weeping, of mourning, of crying. And this describes those who who have a relationship with the living God in times of craziness, in times of sorrow, in times of weeping, in times of despair. And they can find that drink. They can find that refreshing fountains through His Word, through His presence, through 
worship, through the great hope that we have, and they can turn sorrow into joy. But listen, also, they can be pools or springs for other people. When people are going through difficult times, you can bless them with words, with faithfulness, with the life that you live, with the service that you give. Like many of you, it's interesting to me, uh, you know, to walk the campus on a Sunday or during an event or during the week, and, and many of you here who serve. I walk in the coffee house, I see volunteers down the children's ministry. During the week, people come up here and serve and vacuum and do things. And, and, and I'm walking around and I'm looking, and you know what it is? It's like a spring of refreshing. It's like, wow, there are people who actually love the Lord and serve Him. And it's not just on Sunday with this. They actually really believe it. They, they go from strength to strength. They, they become these springs in the valley of Baca for people. They're growing and, and drawing near to the Lord. See, see, here's the thing. The heart and the face of the invisible God becomes visible through people who serve and know Him. Amen? It just does. You know God better through people who serve Him and love Him by looking at them. They become for us these valleys and springs when we're going through difficult times or hard times or even just the monotony of the day and someone shows up and there are those people. You know who they are. You see them and you go, ah, a spring, refreshing. And, and this, 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 this is what it means to know and follow and live with a God who's alive. They go from strength to strength. O Lord, God of hosts, verse 8, hear my prayer, give ear, O God of Jacob. O God, behold our shield and look upon the face of your anointed. Now, now let me have your attention. Here's what he's saying here. God, make me like this. Help me be strong to serve and bless and refresh. O oh Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. I want to be this kind of spring and, and this fountain and baca. And then he says, O oh God, behold our shield. And really it's better translated, O oh shield, behold. Because God is our shield. He's the shield. The psalmist is talking here to the Lord. And it's kind of like he's saying this, Lord, I see your blessing and power, and I want you to do this in my life. I want you to make me like this. 4 verse 10, a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Life is better, he says, with the living God. And there's no other place I would rather be. I don't know if you remember the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, and afterwards he kind of rebuked the people because they kept coming to him. And he says, oh, you, you're coming because uh, of the food, because I fed you. And he began to tell them, I'm the living bread. If you eat of me and drink of me, you'll never thirst, you'll never go hungry. And it said, and many went away because this was a difficult and hard saying. And Jesus looked to his disciples, and he said, do you want to go away also? And Peter spoke up. He said, Lord, where would we go? You alone have the words of eternal life, and we've come to know and realize that you are the Christ, the Son of God. Where would I go? I, I, I read this passage, and I thought to myself, where, where it says there in verse 10, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. So I asked my wife, Last night, I said, Lynn, if God came to you, he said, Lynn, I'll give you one day in heaven. You can see Jesus. You can talk to Paul. You can sit down with Moses. You can see your dad. You can see all these people that you love that are in heaven. I'll, I'll give you one day, but it's going to cost you three years down here. Would you do it? 
She goes, of course I would do it. I said, well, better is one day at your course than a thousand days elsewhere. That's about three years, right? So you might be thinking, I don't know if I have three years left down here. I, I just end up staying up there. <laughs> That'd be okay, right? So, so what, what, the, what the psalmist is saying, Lord, if I could just spend one day with you, it's better than any raging party that's here on earth that I would go to forever. And basically, he's saying, life with the Lord, well, there's nothing that compares. Life with the living God and all that's come before that, how lovely my soul longs and faints. The, the sparrow who feels insignificant finds a home. The, the swallow who can't, can't find rest, who's always erratic, even he can find a place to dwell. And I can become this, this spring, this refreshing for those who are weeping. Hear my prayer, God, you're my shield. It's because of you, just one day with you, Lord, would be better than a thousand elsewhere. For God is a sun, verse 11, and a shield, for the Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Lord, you're my light, you're my protection. Favor and honor and grace and mercy lifts us out of our sense of failure. Even in difficult times, he gives grace and peace. And he, and he takes this, this, this great description, if you will, of what it means to have a relationship with the living God. And that's the theme of the whole passage. And he sums it up in the very last verse. And he says, O Lord of hosts, Lord of everyone, Lord of multitudes, of thousands, blessed is the man or the woman who trusts in you. There's life, he says. The man, the woman who has learned that life with the living God is blessed. And the more you know him, the more you want to know him. In fact, how lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, it even faints for the courts of the Lord. And my heart, all that's inside me, and even my flesh, all that's outside of me, cries out for the living God. Not some dead, stale religion. Not some church attendance that's optional, I'll go, maybe I won't. Not some, you know, ritual or some kind of ceremony, but a God who is alive, who makes my heart a lovely place. How miraculous is that? That God could take your heart and make it a lovely place. Because here's the deal. God knows your heart. It's wicked, right? And he'll make it a lovely place.